56% of people over the age of 65 will need extended care, also known as long-term care, to the point where you should be able to trigger your long-term care insurance policy, okay? Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Functional Retirement Podcast. Today, we're talking about long-term care. I'm your host, Thatcher Taylor, and I have a very special guest, Kelly Augsperger, that's going to talk to us in depth about what we need to be thinking about when it comes to long-term care. Kelly, thanks for joining us. Thatcher, thrilled to be here. Looking forward to it. Awesome. So we're going to start off with some statistics from Morningstar about long-term care that kind of spawned this whole episode. A couple of these you may agree with, a couple of these you may not since you're in the field, but let's go over a few of these I think are very interesting. The first one is 70%, 70% of people turning age 65 will develop a severe long-term care need in their lifetime. The next one is 48% or almost half of people turning 65 will need some type of paid long-term care services in their lifetime. And then this is an interesting one. Dementia comes into a lot of these statistics, and I'll link this below. 48.8% of nursing home residents are going to have a diagnosis of depression, and 17% of nursing home residents have experienced a fall. So it seems like there's a high likelihood of people as we get older needing long-term care. Tell me what you think about those. Yeah. So Thatcher, I love and hate statistics. (laughs) I feel like they can definitely highlight the need of planning or the need of whatever the topic is, but they might be a little misleading. So let's start with the first statistic you said, 70% of people over the age of 65 will need, and actually you said severe long-term care, right? We'll have some type of need of severe long-term care, I believe is what you said. So- There's there's some, I think, um, misrepresentation here. So really what the statistic is, people over the age of 65 will need some form of long-term care, 70%, okay? Not necessarily severe. It could be, I just need some help with meal preparation, with laundry. Maybe I do need some help with showering, but not necessarily severe, The real statistic that's out there, and this is um, actually a newer study, I believe it was released earlier this year, says that 56% of people over the age of 65 will need extended care, also known as long-term care, to the point where you should be able to trigger your long-term care insurance policy, okay? Meeting the tax-qualified language okay, of a policy. And that is Thatcher, if you need help with two out of six activities of daily living, or you have a cognitive impairment and need supervision, and your expected need of care is more than 90 days, and you fulfilled your elimination period. So based on that standardized language, about 56% of people over the age of 65 will need that sort of long-term care. Okay. Um, And then the second one that you said, I think you said 48% will need, what was it? I said a couple of them. It said needs some type of, which is, I think where you were just going, some type of paid long-term care services. So not severe, but kind of where you were just talking, just some sort of assistance. Right. So, and that's really back to the 70%. So really about 70%, most of Americans will need some form of form of help as they age, either due to, you know, just aging and and mobility and balance and strength and all of those things, or it's a cognitive impairment. So the point here is we don't need to get bogged down in the numbers, but the point of these statistics is we need to plan, right? As Americans, there is a high chance that we or someone close to us in our family will need help as we age, or maybe it's due to some type of illness or Um, you know, fall or something like that. But most often it's just due to aging. So we need to plan. We need to best plan for our family and our finances to best protect both of them. That's really the point I think we need to gather from those statistics. Agreed, agreed. And when if, if anybody goes and looks at this particular article, it links to the original abstract and you actually pretty much nailed it. When it says severe, it doesn't necessarily talk about, you know, maybe you suffered a fall and you needed some long-term care from there for a certain period of time. So there's a lot that goes into it, 
but you basically described kind of the next places we want to go. You talked about tax qualifications, activities of daily living, benefit period, elimination period. So you mentioned a lot of those little details, which I think is the direction we want to go next. So let's turn to talking about what long-term care is specifically. So tell us a little bit about for a person that just has maybe heard the phrase long-term care. Tell us a little bit more what at a high level, what long-term care or long-term care planning is. Yeah, I'd love to, because I think there's lots of misperceptions about what it is. I think when when you say the term long-term care, what do you think, Thatcher? I think, so I've been in the industry for a while, so my mind has been shifted a little bit, but I think that there's going to be a point where your health is going to deteriorate and you're going to need some sort of assistance Mm -hmm. by some sort of professional in the world, whether it's at a nursing home or at your own residence. And you can pay for that two ways. You can pay for it by yourself. You just pay out of your whatever investments or savings you have, or you have a policy that will help pay for that. It's a long-term care is the insurance policy where you defer the risk to the insurance company that they'll end up paying a portion to you to help pay for those types of benefits. If you're physically incapable of taking care of yourself or the two out of six activities of daily living, which we'll get to. So that's kind of what I think it is. Lots of detail there. Uh, Let me just tell you briefly what, when I'm working with clients and I ask them this, you know, first off, why are we planning? What are you concerned about? And second, what does long-term care mean to you? What do you think it is? What do you visualize? Most people visualize nursing home. That's what most people think Mm -hmm. when they hear the term long-term care, they just associate them together. And what I really debunk is long-term care, also known as extended care. And I like to use extended care when talking about planning for long-term care, because I think it removes some of those negative connotations is saying, okay, when we're thinking about the future, we're planning for extended care. um, It could mean nursing home care, but oftentimes it does not. And that's the very last stop if anyone ever even makes it there. So what we're really talking about is if you need help throughout the day, either physically or you need supervision due to a cognitive impairment, that's what we're talking about. This could be paid care by professionals, or it could be on an informal basis from a family member or a friend who is not a professional and we're not paying them. So Mm -hmm. that's what we're really talking about when we're talking about planning for extended care is, you know, it could be at your home. It could be in a family member's home. It could be an assisted living. It could be adult daycare. It could be residential care home. It could be nursing home. There's lots of different locations. It's not a location. It's do I need help throughout the day? That's what we're talking about. And back to the beginning, what we talked about, most people are going to need help, right? And Yes, it could be a fall. It could be some type of an illness, but most often it's just to the fragility of aging, right? When we're talking about planning for extended care, I think what we need to focus on is longevity, okay? Mm -hmm. So when I'm working with clients, I ask them, do you anticipate living beyond the age of 80? Do you think it's reasonable for you based on your health history, your genetics, your lifestyle? You know, are you living a pretty active, healthy lifestyle? Are you taking care of yourself? You know, are you going to the doctor? Are you doing any of these things? Are you exercising, eating well? You know, is it reasonable that you could live to age 80 or beyond? Most people say yes. Very few people say, no, I'm just going to die at the age of 70 of a heart attack, you know, or in my sleep. Most people are going to be pretty positive about, yeah, I, I, I do think I'll probably live a pretty long time. Okay. So if we think we're going to live a long time, Is it reasonable to assume that we might need some help along the way, right? Due to those things, mobility, fragility, muscle, strength, balance. Balance is a huge one, right? I mean, you can can exercise, and I'm a big, big proponent of that, and I know you are too, Thatcher. Exercising regularly, eating well, and those things are fantastic. But even as we age, especially as we get into our 80s and 90s, even if we're doing those things, we still might need some help, right? So I think that's that's what we need to focus on is longevity and how do we best plan for the future? I know when you, like when you're running income plans, Thatcher, how old are clients when you run income plans? Like 95, 92, 
what do you do? Mm, it kind of depends. Yeah, it the age is vary, but it it just depends. It that Maybe old, yeah. Some 95. people get that old. Yeah, I, I'm starting to plan for those longer lifespans, especially this day and age. It does seem people are living longer. So yeah, absolutely. Right. So if we're running income plans to 90, 95 or beyond, why wouldn't we also do that for extended care? Right? Mm -hmm. yep. If you're not running your income plans to that, if you're just running your income plans to age 80, well, then that changes things, right? But most financial planners are running income, plan income plans to 90, 95 because we're planning for longevity. We should do the same thing for our health and for our wellness and for our family. Okay, if I need care, what's going to happen? We need to come up with a plan. Okay, and a basic, I think a basic long-term care, extended care plan, we need to talk about these things. Number one is who is going to provide care? Who are those caregivers? Is it a family member? Is it Are they professionals? Is it a combination? What's it going to be? Number two, where do I want to receive care? Do I want to stay at home as long as possible? Have I considered assisted living? There are lots of really nice assisted livings now. You know, a lot of nice communities, especially if you end up single, widowed. Being at home alone is tough. I mean, you in the beginning talked about depression in nursing homes. Absolutely, right? Or even if you're at home and you're widowed, absolutely there can be depression. So wanting to plan for that's important. Where do we want to receive care and can we receive care? And then third, how are we going to pay for it? Most often when I'm talking to clients, they say, Kelly, I don't want to be a burden to my family, to my spouse, to my partner, to my kids, whoever's in their life. I don't want to be a burden. Or maybe they're single and they don't have family to depend on, right? Who's going to provide that care? Well, we need to come up with a plan of how we can pay professionals to do the heavy lifting so that your family members don't have to do the physical day-to-day -day stuff, but that they can be your family member, right? They can be your spouse, your daughter, your son. They can help coordinate maybe and supervise care, but they're not having to do the physical day in and day out activities of daily living. And that's the goal. So if we can identify, you know, um, who's going to provide care, where we want to receive care and how we're going to pay for care, we can have a, we can be set up for, for success really and a better outcome. That's right. Yeah, that, that's right. And uh, you really struck on the planning portion and the family portion. Just an example, we just bought this house a couple months ago. The family that owned it was an older couple and they had to move because they couldn't manage the house because the husband had to sleep downstairs and couldn't help take care of the property. So it was the older spouse, the wife that had to do essentially everything. And it was a somewhat of a burden on the family. So they had to sell the house. They had to downsize and move. So you can see how the health really affects the family in the familial situation. So I think you brought up a really good point there. So I want to switch gears just a little bit. We're going to do, have a little fun. We're going to do a little bit of a rapid fire questionnaire. And this is going to help just set the stage of the nuts and bolts of a long-term care policy. So it's going to be about five questions. We're going to put some pieces in place and then we're going to start to dive deeper into each piece as we work through this episode a little bit more. Okay, so question one, where do you buy long-term care insurance? You're going to buy it from an agent or an advisor, okay? And they're going to have, if, if you're long-term care certified and you have your licenses, you have extra training in how to offer these solutions, these policies. So um, ideally, you're working with someone that does this often and, and is very up-to-date on what's available, Right. Um, so whether that's your financial advisor that's that does these all the time, or you work with a specialist like myself, who I often work with, I work with advisors. So I serve as a specialist to advisors and help their clients, but you're going to reach out to them um, and work with them in how to create the right policy for you. Awesome. And they, Perfect. Okay. And those, and those advisors and agents are then contracted with insurance companies. And ideally you connect with an advisor or agent who is independent, meaning they work with lots of different insurance companies and not just one, which is what we call we would call captive, but lots of different insurance companies to be able to offer the right recommendation for you because we'll talk about this later, but health matters. And so we got to make sure that we are aligning you with the right company. Absolutely. That's perfect. And so next question, activities of daily living. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah. So the insurance company, we talked a little bit in the beginning about qualified long-term care insurance contracts and there's language, right? There's specific standardized language. And in those contracts, there are six activities of daily living that are listed, transferring, toileting, bathing, dressing, eating, and continence. These are things we do every day. We don't even think about, right? We get up, we move, we get dressed, we use the restroom, you know, we're eating, we're doing all these things. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about activities of daily living. And then the physical, or that's the physical impairment or cognitive impairment. That's going to be, you know, if your judgment, your reasoning, all those things are compromised um, and you need supervision to make sure you're safe. Examples, dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. Yep, the big one, the big three. Yeah. So next piece, question number three here is, Tell us about some of the monetary pieces. There's going to be the premiums. There's going to be the elimination period. There's going to be the benefit period. Just as quickly as you yeah. can, tell us about those kind of three areas and yeah. any other monetary pieces that come into long-term care. Yeah. So four basic components of a policy. You've got your monthly or daily benefit. This is how much income the insurance company is going to pay you based on per day or per month. Okay. It could be $2,000. It could be up to $15,000 depending on the company uh, per month. Um, the second is benefit period. How long will benefits last? Two years? All the way, we have some carriers that offer lifetime benefits, okay, and in between, two years to unlimited. Um, the third is elimination period. Um, how long do you have to wait until benefits begin? This is like your deductible, kind of like for your homeowner's insurance or car insurance, is except for um, um, a dollar amount, it's an amount of time. And 90 days is a pretty typical elimination period amount of time that you are self-funding your care until benefits begin. And then um, fourth is inflation protection. This is huge, okay? Fourth component of a policy, most people do inflation protection. This means our policy is going to increase in value over time. Since most people buy policies when they're younger, typically, and they're about their 50s, maybe 60s, you know, most likely we're not gonna need care for a long time, hopefully. And so we want our benefits to grow over time. So we want inflation protection, we want growth. That's what it does. And then the fifth thing would be premium. You know, How much does it cost? That's right, okay, that's perfect. So that's kind of the monetary portion outside of what you're gonna need as far as like the family or the investment or what it's not gonna be able to cover, that whole income distribution strategy we talked about a little bit earlier. Those are kind of the nuts and bolts of what you need to assume is going to happen in the long-term care process. So the next piece that I wanted to ask you about, kind of question four in the rapid fire is underwriting. Talk to us a little bit about underwriting for long-term care. Oh boy. Okay. So this is so important. Um, underwriting, what does it mean? The, health, the insurance company is assessing your health and your medical history to see if you are at a risk that they want to take on. Okay. So you may have a lot of money and be able to afford long-term care insurance, but your health is what really buys it. Your health is what gets you in the door. If you're not healthy enough to qualify, you cannot get coverage. So this is why it's so important to look into long-term care insurance before you have you know, a bunch of diagnoses and you're on a lot of medications and you have serious issues because you might not qualify or it might be really expensive. So as far as underwriting goes, something that I do like in the very, very beginning, even before we look at solutions is I health pre-screen my clients. So I have uh, an online pre-screen form that I send them and I say, please fill this out. And it's intuitive. So if you answer yes, there are additional questions. And then I usually follow up with maybe even more additional questions. But the goal here is we are doing health pre-screening upfront to maximize and hopefully get the have the best success, uh, meaning that we can identify solutions that you are most likely able to qualify for in the beginning um, rather than later because, and this is why it's so important, Thatcher, let's say you don't do health pre-screening, you don't answer a lot of health questions up front before you submit an application and you get declined by the insurance company, uh, particularly if it's a traditional solution, we'll talk about this, I'm sure in a little bit, but if you're declined by one insurance company, another insurance company might say, we don't even want to look at you. This other company said that they declined you. Guess what? We don't want to touch you. So you've just ruined your chances of getting possibly approved with another carrier because you were already declined. So health pre-screening, so, so important. Have to do that up front. And then Absolutely. And like so you shop that pre-screen, right? Absolutely. So what I do is I, you know, I look at all their medical 
you know, data that they've given me and health information. And then I'm going to my different underwriters and it's blind and that the underwriters don't know who it is. You know, they have the health information, but they don't know who it is. And so I'm able to see, Hey, you know, based on this information, do we have a good shot at coverage? And they'll say, yes, it's okay to quote or no, we might need to wait X amount of months or X amount of years, you know, because we've got X, Y, and Z going on. So that's why it's really important. And then oftentimes, you know, carriers have different underwriting guidelines. So one carrier might say, yeah, we'll, you know, go ahead and submit an application. Whereas another one might say, no, we need a good, you know, an, um, an additional six months until we will look at this client. Interesting. Yeah. Underwriting is so important. It's like life insurance, but it, they view it a little bit differently because of those they activities do. of daily living Morbidity. and the cognitive impairment. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. So life, in, life insurance looks at mortality and long-term <clears throat> care looks at morbidity. Okay. But then if you're talking about another type of life, um, long-term care coverage that combines with life coverage, they actually look at both. They look at mortality and morbidity. That's so right. That's right. That's what we're getting down to. It's more strict underwriting. So we have to make sure that we know your information up front so we can find the right solution for you. And that leads me to question five on the rapid fire is filing claims because they mm -hmm. are so strict and there is that underwriting process and you may pay premiums for decades. You could pay yeah. premiums for a long period of time. Then all of a sudden you feel like you need to file a claim. Let's talk about the filing the claims process. What could initiate that, whether it's physical or cognitive. Tell us a little bit about that claims process. Yeah. So number one, the insurance companies, it's a contract, right? between you and the insurance company. And so there's specific standardized language of in order to receive benefits, this is what has to happen. And in a qualified long-term care insurance contract, this is the language, okay? And I said it already, but here it is again. If you need help with two out of six activities daily living, which we've already stated what those are, right? And your expected need of care is more than 90 days and you fulfilled your elimination period, guess what? You've qualified, right? Now, they, you have to prove it you're going to have to prove that, and that's going to be shown in your medical records, but that's the language. Or you have a cognitive impairment, and you're expecting need of care is more than 90 days. You fulfilled your elimination period. Benefits begin. Um, but what's really important, Thatcher, and I think where there probably there's probably been a lot of negative reviews online about claims is because people are – don't – Maybe they qualify for coverage, but it's not noted in their medical records, okay? Th I see this. Mm -hmm. I see this happen where, you know, okay, mom or dad, yeah, they need help with bathing and they need help um, getting dressed in the morning and at night. That's okay. So we've met two out of the six activities of daily living and doctor expects their need of care more than 90 days. And we've met our elimination period. But if it's not explicitly noted in the medical records of this is a, this is what the, the insured needs help with, this is what the policyholder needs help with, and it's not black and white, the insurance company can't guess, right? They need to see that proof. So what I tell clients is at claim time, and this is really probably going to come down to their children. I mean, let's face it, you know, policyholder, if you're in your mid-80s or your 90s, your kids are the ones that are probably going to be initiating the claim. And so- before you file a claim, make sure the medical records properly document exactly what's going on. So there are no guesses. It's not gray, but it's black and white. So the insurance company can clearly see this is what's going on to be able to prove a claim and to make it go faster. Okay. So I think that's really important, but the claims process, you know, each company is going to have paperwork to fill out. Um, and so that, that paperwork is going to need, be, need to be filled out. They will request those medical records from their PCP, you know, that primary care doctor, and they're going to review all that information. They're going to make a decision, you know, do they meet the contract language? Yes or no. Okay. If it's yes, and it's clearly noted in the medical records, claim approved. Okay. Um, and so that, that's really how the process works. I will tell you. I know that a lot of advisors and agents, you know, they they might have sold this 30 years ago and now they're out of business, they're, they're retired, right? I mean, this happens often. And so that agent or advisor is not there to help them through the process. What do you do? What do you do in that situation? You know, you you go to the insurance company, um, you know, and say, we need to initiate a claim. What do we need to do? But if, if the advisor or agent is still in business and has not retired, it's that advisor and agent's job. It really is to help you through the process as best as they can. Um, in my opinion, it's their job. I mean, that's, you know, that's, if I have a client that needs assistance, I'm going to help them as best as I can. So that's just 100%. That's a huge piece of this is 
Yeah. You need someone on your side because the insurance company isn't necessarily on your side. They're thinking about their bottom line. They're in business. They have big buildings for a reason. So when it comes to filing those claims, if you don't have someone that's knowledgeable, that's going to help clean this up and go to bat for you, you're kind of left out on an island and trying to trust the insurance company, which probably isn't, isn't your best bet. Yeah, you do. You need an advocate and you don't probably know the questions to ask, right? Um, I mean, you'll, you'll get the paperwork and you'll fill out the paperwork, but it can be confusing and there's a lot of paperwork. And so if you don't understand it, you need, you need someone, an advocate to be able to help. I do know there are companies actually specific companies that will help in the claims process. And then there are actually even like home care companies, many, not many, but there are definitely some home care companies where they even have like a long-term care insurance advocate that works for them to help to really streamline the process. So I always recommend my clients like, Hey, you're getting home care. Look for a home care agency. Like, you know, if I didn't help them with the policy, look for a home care agency that has, that specializes in even in submitting these claims for you and help you through the process. Cause it will really simplify your life, your family's life and, and just make it a whole lot easier. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. And let's, I want to ask about, uh, let's call this kind of five a, when you're filing a claim, and just clarify this for me, from my understanding, when you file a claim, in the doctor's records need to be very clear on yeah. what the problems are so the insurance company doesn't have to try to interpret it. You need to make sure that the doctor or the situation is a long-term situation, yeah. not that it's going to last just for a month like it's a broken bone. It needs to be set physically that way. The cognitive impairment or the physical disabilities or the activities of daily day living, it needs to be a long term period of time for those particular More things for the days. insurance to kick in. More than That's ninety right. days. That's right. So your doctor, you know, and it's as simple as the doctor is making notes of, I anticipate the, this person to need care for an extended amount of period, you know, more than 90 days, that this is not going to be, I'm going to heal up quickly and recover. You know, it's like what the broken hip, you know, people break their hips, they have hip surgery, but they recover. They're expected to recover in a fairly short amount of time, you know, typically less than 90 days, maybe a little longer, but um, sometimes not, but you know, if it is where like I'm aging and you know, it just, it's not looking good that I'm just going to recover from aging. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I, my balance is probably not going to miraculously uh, improve overnight. So yeah, it, it needs to be clearly documented and the doctor needs to make notes of that. And this is the time where the person, you know, the insured, the policy holder, this is not the time for them to be bold and brave and say, Oh, everything's fine. I, you know, I can do it on my own. I'm, I'm getting along just fine. Because a lot of people will say that when indeed they need a lot of help. And so that's where the adult children need to come in and say, mom and dad, that's not what's going on here, right? And if the children can go to the doctor's appointments with mom or dad, that is huge because they can speak up and say, no, 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 that's not really what's going on, right? We've got a more serious issue than mom or dad is indicating and they have to speak up, right? They really do. They need to speak up and, and tell the truth. What's really going on in this situation? Yep, absolutely. And so let's just, let's review. Activities, activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, which is like getting in and out of bed or getting out of a chair, eating and continence. Those are the six ADLs. Then the big three cognitive ones are Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And, and with the cognitive, I mean, they do cognitive tests for this. So, mm -hmm. you know, they'll be able to identify, you know, based on reasoning and safety and, and just decision making of whether or not, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an issue here. Yep, absolutely. And just a side note for everyone listening, it, if you're kind of at that point in life where you're trying to figure out, oh man, how do I start to avoid some of these things? Just a really cool tool that I just read is Outlive by Peter T. It's a book that just came out. If you want to work on your physical and cognitive particular situation, it kind of sidebar from the long-term care discussion we're having, but Outlive by Peter T is a phenomenal book that you can work on some of these to help maybe prepare for this. However, I think you said one of the coolest things that you said so far, if you feel like these things are happening, don't be scared to work on the claim with the right support staff around you. You've been paying these premiums. You may feel like there's a problem with transferring or toileting or whatever it may be. Filing a claim probably is in your best interest 
because you have the policy as long as you feel like the doctor and you and the family are all on the same page. Is that right? It's probably a good idea to file the claim. You know what? Get those benefits as soon as you can. <laughs> that's, that's my <laughs> that's what I'm talking that's about. That's my motto, right? Like you've paid premiums for probably a long time. And if you meet the contract language, file a claim. Get that income because yeah. we don't know how long you're going to need care. Maybe it's six months. Maybe it's six years, right? But the sooner that you can get that income to be able to pay for care, the better off you're going to be and the better off your family's going to be. Absolutely. I love it. I love that part. Okay. So we've kind of broken down now a lot of the pieces of a long-term care policy. Now there's a ton of nuance. We could spend about three days talking about the nuance. In fact, all long-term care courses and study programs, they do, they literally take days to be able to pass the test. Yeah. But the place that I want to go to next is when do we start thinking about long-term care? And here's what I mean. We mentioned before that long-term care, it's important to be healthy. So you're healthy and you're kind of moving through life. So you're not thinking about getting old and needing care. But at what ages, is there kind of an age range when you're working with your clients that you think, all right, it's time to really start implementing the process of getting underwritten and potentially paying premiums for long-term care? Yeah, most of my clients are in their 50s, Thatcher, okay? okay. And at this point, um, most of my clients, their kids are grown not always, but most of most of the time they're grown or maybe they're in college um, and they may or may not be off payroll, if you will, right? Like mom and dad mm -hmm. aren't paying for everything anymore. Um, and so they're not having necessarily all those expenses for their kids anymore. And they're getting really serious about retirement. You know, they can see it's on the horizon. They're not there yet, but they know that this is a piece of the puzzle in retirement planning. What happens if I need care? We know it's expensive. How do we best protect my family and finances? So in the 50s is generally a good time, you know, age 50. Okay. You know, if we have a good nest egg, you know, we've got a nice, you know, emergency savings, we're doing a good job, you know, saving, we have our DI, we have our life insurance, you know, check, check, check. Okay. Now it's time to look at planning for extended care, long-term care insurance. You know, can we afford it? Can we qualify for it? Right. So 50s generally is a great time to look into long-term care. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I have clients that are in their 60s and 70s, but the older that you get, the more expensive it is and the harder it is to health qualify, which means there may be fewer options for you. So, you know, ideally, yes, let's in their 50s is a great time, but I, I work with a lot of advisors where I encourage them to plant seeds into their clients' minds way earlier than 50s. You know, even when you take them on as clients, it might even be in their 20s or 30s. Hey, we're not here yet. You know, we've got some other things that we need to address, but this is an important piece of your family and financial plan. So we do need to address this. You know, we're just not quite there yet, right? If we've got other important things on the docket to do, you know, we still have kid, young kids at home and, you know, life insurance needs and all those. Okay, we're not ready for long-term care insurance, but uh, once we get there, okay, now is the time because that way you've planted those seeds. The clients are familiar with the topic. They're familiar with, you know, the idea of it. And now, okay, let's get serious about this and actually look at options. And I will say that I think that often what is a big piece of the puzzle that is missed when we're discussing planning for extended care, long-term care insurance stature is that too often people are only focusing on money. Like, okay, we know long-term care is expensive. Let's get a policy to pay for it. Okay, well, of course, that's a piece of the puzzle, right? But when we buy a policy, yes, we are trying to protect our finances, our income, num uh, number one, because this is really an income problem. It's not an asset problem. You could have $3 million worth of assets, but if it's not liquid and we don't have income, it doesn't do us any good, right? It's an income problem. But what's really important here, Thatcher, is our family, we want to mm -hmm. minimize these consequences, these burdens to our family and have a plan, which we've discussed earlier, and have a way to pay for that plan. And that is what long-term care insurance does. It's protecting your finances, but, but it's protecting your family so that they don't have to physically provide care. You can pay people to provide care. Yeah. In fact, that's what I was going to say. So if you're age 50 and you're really proactive, you figure out, all right, I'm going to, 
get some long-term care to help protect my financial situation later in life. That is one component. But I feel like there are a lot of 50-year-olds that are starting to see, because their parents are getting older, they're starting to see what late life experiences are firsthand, how aging is very, very difficult. They might be starting to see those experiences themselves and be like, I do not want my family or kids or whoever to have to do what I'm doing for my parents right now. So it might be a personal thing that people are like, I got to get, I got to do something. And the reason I say that is I have some clients right now that are going through that. They have a parent that I think has some dementia. They're really struggling. And they're like, I need long-term care right now. Let's implement it right away. I don't want my kids to have to deal with this. And me personally, so I'm 38. I have kids that will be out of high school in their, when I'm in kind of like my mid fifties. Mm-hmm. So they'll be out. Hopefully they've launched. I've done my job and they launch out. That's when I might be thinking about long-term care. That's why I think 50 is such a good age to really start implementing long-term care. And from my perspective as the financial planner, making sure that we can pay the premiums shouldn't be a concern. It just needs to be factored into your plan as you go into retirement and then make sure it's built into the income distribution strategy throughout retirement and you should be off to the races. Is that kind of how you view it as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If we can, if we can get really serious about it at age 50 and say, okay, let's see if now's a good time. Let's take a look at your health and and see if we can qualify and we can pay for the premiums, right? That's not an issue. Absolutely. Let's do it. You know, you don't need to wait another couple of years, three, four, five, six years, because what happens? What if you get some diagnosis, right? Oh, I've got prostate cancer. And that's actually a pretty uh, benign cancer, if you will. I mean, no cancer is benign, but you know, mm-hmm on the spectrum of cancer, right? Most people are expected to recover from prostate cancer. And so, you know, but even something like that, it's, well, gosh, we're going to have to wait, right? We need recovery. We need a stability period after recovering from cancer. And if it's a more severe cancer, you know, it's going to be even longer waiting period. So that's why I say, you know, you're healthy enough to qualify. You can afford it why wait? Like you just need to do it, you know, because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Your health's not guaranteed tomorrow. Um, and as far as, you know, personal experience goes, so many of my clients have a personal experience and that truly motivates them to plan because they don't want, they, they know what it's like. They know how difficult it is. They want to get a plan in place to protect their family. 100%. Absolutely. So let's try to, let's try to have some fun. Now, before we do this, I'm going to tell everyone, none of these, if we actually make this work out the way that I have planned in my mind, so we'll try. This this is not a recommendation, and these are not actual numbers you should take in your situation. But I want to try to have some fun and see if we couldn't maybe try to put some general numbers to kind of the pieces of a long-term care policy, like create a a fake scenario of a 55-year-old that's moderately healthy. What could they expect to pay in premiums for, say, 30 years? What could they expect to pay for like an elimination period for 90 days? And then what they could potentially receive in benefits in a very basic scenario. Is there a way that we could create kind of a numbers based fake world that people just so they can take with them and be like, oh, okay, I kind of get what's going on here. Could we do that? Absolutely. So let's say we've got a 55, 55 year old couple. Okay. Spouses. Cause oftentimes Mm -hmm. we have partners or spouses that are applying together and a real benefit here in doing that factor is you get a discount when you apply with a partner or a spouse. Okay. You get a mm-hmm. discount for that, but then you also have the ability to share benefits and that is huge. So anytime that we can have partner spouses share benefits, we will do that. Okay. So mm-hmm. let's say we've got 55 year old couple. They live in Ohio. They've got a few kids. They're, you know, they're in their twenties. They're, they're launched. <laughs> they're on their own mm-hmm. and they're really serious and they're ready about planning for um, extended care. We've talked and we've said, okay, you know, we've got income. We've got some other assets. We're not looking to fund a hundred percent of our care cost. Most people are mm-hmm. not. Most people just want a meaningful amount that's going to cover a chunk of care costs. It helps to keep the premiums down, okay, but transfer some of those risks and transfer some of those consequences. So let's say we're looking at a policy with a a starting monthly benefit of $4,000, okay, meaning if we go on claim in year one, okay, we're going to receive $4,000. We're going to grow that, okay, by 3% compound every single year, okay, so it's going to continue to grow. And their total, and we're going to do this for three years, okay? 
So we've got a, a benefit period of three years, but then the ability to share benefits. Okay. So essentially you get three years beyond if you need more than three years, you can dip into your spouse's bucket of money. Okay. Um, your starting policy limit would be about probably $144,000. Okay. Um, and we've got that growth at 3% monthly premiums for this couple would be about $450 a month or okay. about $5,000 a year. Okay. And so that would be obviously on a monthly or an annual basis for the rest of your life or until you pass away or until you go and claim. Okay. Many companies have waiver of premium where when you go on claim, you don't pay premiums. Okay. So that's, that's an example of, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you know, we've got $4,000 a month, year one, it's going to grow over time by 3%, um, three years, $144,000, you know, each, they each have $144,000, but access to their spouse's bucket of money. So in my mind, you know, gosh, and, and especially if you're working with a financial planner, you're probably doing a good job of saving and investing $450 a month is, in my mind, you know, pretty doable. If we, if we have decent income and, and you know, we're investing, um, at least for most of my clients, that's pretty doable. Yeah, for sure. So tell me a couple, I, I pulled up a couple of statistics while you were talking here and I want to see if you think I know how we feel about statistics, but average long-term care cost in Ohio, I just a simple Google says mm -hmm. for a private room in a nursing home is 93 grand, but for care in like assisted living, or a home healthcare service is like 50 grand, give or take. Do you think those numbers are pretty high? Yeah. So, so there are lots of cost of care studies out there. And I do look at one, in one particular, I generally look at Genworth's cost of care study. It's a little outdated. It's from 2021. That's probably what you're looking at. Is that what you're looking at? No, this is just uh, the first thing that popped up Ohio Department of Insurance. Okay. Oh, ODI. Okay. Which probably isn't, eh, which I don't, I mean, I don't know how accurate those are, but yeah. the only reason so I'm bringing I, this up is because you talk about the monthly payout, like 4,000 bucks a month, $48,000 yeah. a year. But you also said earlier that it's just a supplement. So that's I don't right. want people to think in this that you should get a benefit amount that's going to cover everything. It's right. just going to help take a huge chunk so it doesn't burden yeah. your existing income distribution strategy. So exactly. continue, but that's kind of what, exactly. why I wanted to bring this up. Yeah. So in Ohio and, you know, I don't even, we don't even need to start with nursing home. Again, that's the last place most people want to be and end up. Right. So let's focus on home right. care and assisted living. Okay. Home care in Ohio, like right now it could be 25 and it's per hour. So it could be $25 an hour to $40 an hour. It really depends on what time of day, what level of care you need, lots of different things. You know, you could be spending $3,000 a care per month on home care, depending on how many hours you could be spending $20,000 a care. If you're like, if you're getting 24 hours a care a day, you know, 365 days a year, you could spend $20,000 a month on home care. So, but at that point, Thatcher, that's when people typically look, if you're needing a high level of care like that, that's when people say, okay, financially, it makes more sense for me to move into like an assisted living where they do have 24 hour care. Okay. So Maybe assisted living is $6,000 a month, okay, for a decent assisted living in Columbus, Ohio, okay? And let's say your policy is 4000 That's covering more than half, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. at that point, that's when you're supplementing. Okay, you've got your policy. Here's your foundation. Here's your base. Anything above your policy limits, anything above what your policy covers, that's where you're co-funding with your other, you know, your other financial um, that you have your income, your investments. And that is typically how most people do it because it could be very expensive to let's say, oh, I want a 10,000 monthly you know, benefit. Oh, that would be great. But there's a premium for that. And most people don't want to pay that premium. So how do we create a policy? This is key. How do we create a policy that is both meaningful and affordable? That's what we're trying to do, okay? And that's why we typically create policies where we are, co-funding. The goal is to co-fund. We've got our policy, plus we have our other income. We've, maybe we've got social security, we've got pension, right? We've got these other forms of income to be able to fill in the gaps. Yeah, I love that. It, it is a kind of a quality of life thing too. This is just a supplement. But when you're, say you hit the activities of daily living when you file a claim and you're getting that $4,000 a month benefit and it's going to whatever. And I should say, this article says this is for 44 hours per week. So yeah, maybe you're only getting yeah. 20 to 22 hours a week, whatever it may be. 
after that, you could still eat steak. You could still have nice couches and nice oh, drinks sure. and nice experiences. So there is a quality of life element that comes back into it that I don't want people just to think you're on long-term care and you're flat broke and right. you're struggling and it's a battle the past couple of years. In fact, long-term care should be an opportunity where you're getting a supplement so you can still live a fulfilling life. Your family is freed up. They can live a fulfilling life. So I, I think it's such a good opportunity as long as you find, like you said, the right policy. That right. I think the right policy really matters. That's right. And you know, a question I like to ask is, are you willing to pay the premium so your family doesn't pay the price? That's really what it comes down to. And so are you willing and able to pay the premiums over you know, years so that in the future, your quality of life, your finances, your family are best protected? And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Yeah, like that's what insurance does. It provides us leverage, helps us transfer risk, transfer consequences, all those things. Tax-free income, we haven't even talked about that yet, but benefits are tax-free, okay? That's one reason we love long-term care insurance is because it's income tax-free. We're not having to convert assets to income to be able to pay for care, right? So um, yeah, the leverage there is is really important in the tax-free benefits. And that's where I was going to go next. I was going to end this on the tax element. Uh, you just mentioned it, because you're paying the premiums along the way, when that money comes, because you're paying premiums with after-tax dollars, when that money comes your way, it is a tax-free benefit for those costs. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if there, So there are different couple types, and we haven't even touched on this, but there are different types of um, methods that benefits are paid, cash versus reimbursement. If it's reimbursement, mm -hmm. benefits are 100% income tax-free. If it's if they're cash benefits, there is a per diem limit. And in 2023, it's four hundred and twenty dollars per day. So that means mm -hmm. if you if you're receiving benefits beyond four hundred and twenty dollars, then that excess would be taxed. But if your care expenses really do exceed that four hundred twenty daily limit and you can prove it, then it's you you're not taxed on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, if you're really getting need a lot of care, um, but, you know, not in, today, most policies are reimbursement and they're not cash. Got it. That's great. That's great. And there's kind of one thing I want to touch on before I forget it. And I, I do the same thing with my wife. Let me just tell you this before I forget it, because it's really important. You mentioned the bucket of $144,000 that could be the potential benefit. But let's say you only file a claim and you only need it for six months. And so use six times four, $24,000. All that means is at that point, you could shut it off, continue paying your premiums. And in the future, maybe in a year, you could refile claims, play, pay the elimination period, and you could dip back into that bucket again. Is that correct? Yeah. So your benefits stay in the policy. So anything unused, it just continues to stay in the policy. And if you've got inflation protection, it just continues to grow. So yes, yeah, sometimes people do file claims more than once. Typically, mm -hmm. once you're on claim, you stay on claim. But sometimes, you know, maybe there is like an accident that happens and you end up needing care for six months, um, but then you recover. Okay, well, you're on claim for a certain period of time. You go off claim, you resume premiums. And then maybe, you know, at age 85, you go on claim then. Okay, mm -hmm. well, you still have benefits in your policy. You're going to file another claim. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. And I think that's and right. So I don't think we touched on, I'm sorry. I don't think we touched on, there's different types of long-term care insurance, right? Available. No, dive into it. Talk, yeah, talk about so, it. So there's really two main types of long-term care insurance. And then there's a third. Um, the first type, and we did a, a case study around the first type. That's traditional standalone long-term care insurance. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is what it sounds like. It's just long-term care insurance. There's no added benefit if you don't need care. It's the most cost-effective way to buy coverage. Okay. You pay premiums. If you need care, you get a benefit. If you don't, there's nothing there, okay? The least expensive, but the hardest to health qualify for, okay? That's traditional. The second is what we call linked benefit, also known as hybrid, also known as asset-based. There are lots of names, and I wish we just had one, but I think it confuses people. And the idea behind this, Thatcher, is if you, you've, you've really got long-term care coverage and then an added benefit, 
And that added benefit is going to be in the form of life insurance, um, a death benefit, or cash value from an annuity. And the idea behind this is if you don't need care, there is a residual value, okay? Mm -hmm. And there's an extension of benefits. There are benefits be available beyond the death benefit. So you've got the death benefit, but then you've got an extra bucket of money, a continuation of benefits, okay? That's the leverage. That's, that's the extension of benefits. So that's hybrid. Then we've got a third type, which is often confused with the second, okay? It's also, it's also life insurance connected with long-term care coverage, but there's not another bucket of money beyond the life insurance. It's just you're only accelerating the death benefit, and that's simply mm -hmm. a permanent life insurance pro um, product with a long-term care rider, okay? Mm -hmm. That's different from the second type we just talked about because the third type, the long-term care rider, only allows you to accelerate the death benefit and there's not inflation protection. Okay. So what type, and there's others that we're not even going to be able to get into today. There's chronic <laughs> illness riders, which we could talk about, which that's not true long-term care coverage. Um, there's actually an immediate care annuity out now. So if you need care right now, there's coverage for you that's available. If you have mm. a single lump sum and you, it's actually health underwritten. So it's very unique so that the sicker you are, the more income you get. Um, there's short-term care insurance. There's lots of different types of pro products available today. So, you know, what's right for you is going to depend on your unique situation. Just like with financial planning, right, Thatcher? Everyone's situation is so unique. No, there's not like the same financial plan. Everybody has a different plan. And so with a policy, it's, it's really the same way. What's going to be right for you is going to be different from your neighbor, right? So it depends on your health. And your finances, your family, your preferences, all those types of things. So you want to work with someone that knows what they're doing so that they can help you navigate, okay, what's best for me? Yeah, that's awesome. And that third one that you mentioned, the rider on the life insurance policy, that could be with whole life, universal life, variable universal life. And I'm assuming it's probably very similar to when you need care, the rider kicks in. It's basically just kind of a partial surrender along the way that reduces the future reduces, death benefit. Is that correct? That's right. That's exactly what it does. It reduces mm -hmm. your death benefit. So you're using up that death benefit in advance. It's a living benefit, yep. if you will. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, I'm actually glad you brought those up. I didn't even think of that. So there we go. I appreciate it. So I always like to end the podcast with another kind of rapid fire series, but I like to ask more general, if you could tell everyone the five most important things that they need to do to make progress in their life. And it could be long-term care related or not long-term care related. It doesn't have to be from any research. It could be anecdotal, but things that you think are really important, five of them that everyone could take with them that they could maybe implement in their life. Okay. Five things. All right. So it's the hot seat. It's it my version of the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's say number one, talk to your family about planning for care. Have a conversation. What are your preferences? You know, if you're a mom and dad, you know, you're, um, you know, maybe in your 50s or 60s, talk to your kids. Like, hey, you know, we're, we've been talking. We, we know that we need to be planning for the future. This, this is what we prefer. And then write it down. Don't just talk about it, but write it down. What you prefer, your care preferences, location, how are you going to pay for it, right? Come up with a plan, okay? Don't don't just expect your kids to take care of you. Not many want to. Yeah, that's and awesome. Many, and not many can. So have the conversation, number one. Two, you know, get the plan together, okay? Um, you've talked about it. Now implement the plan. What's it going to be? Where are you going to receive care, right? Write it down. And then how are you going to pay for it? That's where the policy comes in. Investigate it. You know, can you get coverage now? Do some pre-screening. See what options are available mm. for you, okay? Um, and do it sooner than later. Don't wait until you're 65 and ready to retire. Do this earlier, okay? Um, third, I would say is, oh boy, Thatcher. <laughs> Third, I would say, I could probably pick out details from the first two. Um, third would be- It could be, be anything. It could anything. be go for a walk. It doesn't matter. <laughs> well, take care of yourself. That's really important. So when we're talking there about we health, when we're talking about health for, you know, planning for the future, because your health and medical history are so important, make sure you, you know, you're exercising, you're eating well, you know, you're visiting the doctor regularly, you're heeding advice, you're doing all these things, take care of yourself. And then I think fourth, 
social, social aspects, really important. Um, and I would even say spiritual. So maybe that's four and five is like, take care of yourself holistically, you know, um, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, health, spiritually, take care of yourself and um, to set yourself up for success. I mean, I know we see in aging that depression is a serious problem. And so even as we are aging, you know, and for our parents and for our grandparents, if you still have grandparents living, you know, visit them, call them, you know, it's really important to stay engaged socially to keep our minds active, but then even, you know, on an emotional level, like our hearts, <laughs> you know, to connect mm -hmm. with people is really, really important. So stay engaged um, in all of those things. So before we go, I want to make sure that Kelly gives everyone an opportunity to go find her socials and her place of business. She's got a phenomenal insurance agency that she actually runs with her husband and a phenomenal dog, it sounds like. So <laughs> Kelly, go ahead and let everyone know where they can find you. And I will also link all this information in the comments and the show notes so you can find them if you want to reach out. So go ahead, Kelly. Thanks, Thatcher. So yeah, our business is Steadfast Insurance. We are an insurance agency in Westerville, Ohio, but I do serve people nationwide. Um, so you can find me at our website, Steadfast Agents with an S.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, Kelly Augsperger with a P as in Paul. Um, um, I also have a podcast, Steadfast Care Planning. And I talk with, talk with a lot of industry professionals and in how do we best plan for care and discuss different issues that older adults face and are navigating, um, especially if you're yourself an older adult, or maybe you have parents that are approaching that age and you're trying to figure out, you know, what do we do? Or you yourself are planning for the future. How do we navigate these issues? I talk about all those kinds of things. Um, and LinkedIn, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm there. I'm active on there. So those are all the places to find me. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Again, I'll put all that information below so everyone can find Kelly. Again, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, Thatcher. Take care. Bye, everybody.